Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, my name is Wayne Callen, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation. It is titled The Whole Person Treatment Approach to ADHD. Many individuals diagnosed with ADHD find it helpful to combine integrative or holistic strategies alongside conventional psychiatric treatments to cultivate physical and emotional well-being. In this presentation, you will learn about the benefits of integrative treatments, such as lifestyle and nutrition modification, supplements, acupuncture, or a consultation with a holistic clinician. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Lydia Zalowska, an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and a faculty member of the University of Minnesota Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. She is an internationally recognized expert in adult ADHD and mindfulness-based therapies. Her research work pioneered the application of mindfulness in ADHD, developed the Mindful Awareness Practices for ADHD program, and helped co-found the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Zalowska, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email we received about an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 374 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of this week's webinar is Play Attention. Enhance brain health and performance. For over 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed at home, school, and work. Their NASA-inspired technology and cognitive exercises improve executive function and self-regulation. Each program includes a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Click here to schedule a free one-on-one -on -one consultation to discuss a customized executive functioning training plan for you. You can either call 800-788 6786, or you can visit their website at www.playattention.com. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. You can ask questions of Dr. Zalowska during her presentation, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after she is done. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Salaska. Thanks so much for being here, for joining us today and leading this discussion. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I um, want to thank you for, uh, for making this happen and for all of you who are joining today, uh, taking the time out of your day to be here. Um, so today I'll be talking about the whole person approach to treating ADHD. So I'll briefly touch on the rationale why we should expand our thinking uh, and approach to ADHD treatment, talk about uh, integrative medicine or integrative psychiatry, um, and I will touch on some of the tools that come from that field, such as um, wellness practices or integrative health strategies that um, some of them you can apply on your own and some of them require you to work with a clinician. Uh, we'll talk about specific applications for ADHD, and then I'm hoping to um, have some questions and, and have time to uh, talk with you uh, in dialogue at the end of the presentation. OK, 
Okay. So first, you know, is ADHD just a problem of attention? Um, and in, in maybe a wider or a broader question, uh, is mental health just something that affects the brain? Uh, something that we think of uh, as, you know, from neck up. Um, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we know that, um, you know, the brain and the body, the mind are interconnected, but our treatments still may have that narrow, narrow focus of let's treat the neurotransmitters in the brain, let's work through psychotherapy, work through the mind, and not always incorporate the body or the, the whole person uh, into our thinking about the disorder and also the treatment. And many of you know, whoops, ah, here, here we go. Many of you know that ADHD, um, the name itself is a little misleading. The focus is on attention deficits and hyperactivity, impulsivity, uh, but it's better conceptualized as a self-regulation disorder. This is a work by uh, Dr. Russ Barkley and others seeing ADHD as something that affects not just attention and cognition and energy levels, but also emotional regulation, um, impulse control. But, and, and with that, um, how, you, um, how a person with ADHD may react to stress. Um, research has also shown that there's a higher risk for accidents, um, relationship difficulties, uh, relationship with yourself, poor self-esteem, and poor self-care. Uh, that is higher when uh, ADHD is in the picture. Other mental health conditions, such as we call them comorbidities, uh, such as anxiety, depression, substance use, and trauma are more common with ADHD. Same with dyslexia, autism, uh, OCD conditions. Um, but also physical conditions are higher when you have ADHD. Uh, in particular, we have pretty good evidence for um, asthma and some um, a topic disease, so uh, different type of allergies. Um, sleep disorders are very common with ADHD, and so are um, eating um, disorders as well as problems with weight. So in a sense, when you think about ADHD, uh, it's not just something that affects your focus, but affects many parts of your life, ma many parts of your health. Um, and, and, in, and importantly, it affects how you can uh, manage daily stressors, daily habits, um, and things that also have this influence on well-being. So here, um, just as ADHD affects many aspects, ADHD treatment can affect many aspects. Um, so if you have a successful uh, ADHD treatment, it will help both the brain, the mind, but can affect um, you know, your, your lifestyle choices, uh, healthy practices can affect how you view yourself, your relationships. So mind, body, spirit, and social, all these dimensions that we think of when, you think, when we think of a whole person uh, can be better. When ADHD management is not done well, uh, when some aspects are maybe ignored or omitted in thinking about uh, uh, in, in treatment, then um, you may see that um, things are not going so well. You may uh, have difficulties with your physical health. There may be difficulties with, um, um, you know, mental health, uh, an aspect, uh, on you, an, an, an outlook on your life. And in this picture on the right-hand side, when your mental health is affected, it's not as if it's just a portion of you that's affected. The whole person is affected. And we know from uh, sciences like psychoneuroimmunology, for example, that immune system, uh, GI system, endocrine system um, is very much intertwined and, and constantly um, talking to the brain, um, to the mind. And so there's these reciprocal relationships going on. I'm sorry. I, I'm skipping the slide, but here we go. Um, so when you think about wellness and, and treatment in ADHD, again, this just shows this relationship that if you treat ADHD symptoms well, uh, things like stress management gets better, your sleep may improve, um, your mood is often better, um, self-esteem 
uh, is higher, and then there's better ability to, for impulse control and then daily habits. He healthier habits are easier to, to keep. The reverse is also true. If you address these uh, secondary things of stress, sleep, mood, self-esteem, or daily habits, it can feed back to ADHD and make ADHD symptoms less severe, less impairing. So that really has presents itself um, uh, in this, you know, feedback loop. And you have opportunities to intervene at different levels. You can intervene, interfere, intervene at the level of ADHD symptoms or these other secondary uh, symptoms and have these downstream effects. So a, a good example is. Uh, uh, anxiety and ADHD. Sometimes we treat anxiety first and ADHD symptoms get better. Sometimes we treat the ADHD symptoms and anxiety gets better. Also true with mood um, and similarly with sleep, for example, or stress. And if you take these, um, you know, different points of entry at treatment into consideration, it also helps to think of, um, you know, what tools can I bring in uh, to help my lifestyle, my stress? And that's where integrative um, mental health can be very helpful. Uh, we have additional tools, tools uh, uh, that are derived from different traditions, things that are not always brought in into, into conventional care. So, you can have this expanded toolbox. And here's some principles that integrative uh, medicine, integrative mental health would apply uh, to treatment. Um, first principle would be that we don't just look at how to uh, mitigate symptoms or uh, absence, of disease, absence of disease, but uh, look at what is optimal well-being. And sometimes optimal well-being can coexist with symptoms. So, um, you can still need to manage symptoms, but looking at, you know, things like meaning, purpose, um, how you relate to yourself uh, are also important. Emphasizing uh, self-healing power of the mind-body connection, looking for opportunities to engage that, uh, looking for um, opportunities to apply self-care skills, so things that you can do on your own to help um, manage ADHD looking for natural or safest long-term treatments. Um, and that may mean uh, varying medications, depending on what's going on in one's life, uh, or combining it with supplements. Uh, also getting to the root cause, and that's where integrative practitioners uh, can be very helpful, trying to do some additional testing, um, uh, try to understand dietary influences and and, and hopefully through those changes, mitigate how severe the symptoms are. Um, and integrative uh, medicine uh, also uh, ascribes to um, this idea that we don't have to use one or the other, the conventional treatments or the holistic or, or alternative treatments, that you can combine the two, that depending on, on what the person needs, depending on the situation, uh, some tools can be phased in or phased out. And it's very much done in a collaborative way uh, between the provider and the, the patient. So here is uh, just a, an overall um, outline of the different tools that can be used in a in whole person or integrative approach to address the mind, body, spirit, social dimensions of a person. Uh, we have conventional strategies. We have fundamental wellness strategies, things that some conventional uh, practitioners are, are already utilizing, something that you can do on your own. And there's some uh, complementary alternative uh, strategies often referred to as CAM uh, that um, are often from other traditions, other cultures, um, or, um, you know, you need a, a special uh, practitioner that's trained in approach to incorporate uh, those approaches. So here's a um, more detailed slide looking at some of, of these strategies. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see conventional strategies um, that we often talk about when treating ADHD, things like parent training, executive function coaching, psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavior therapy, but also therapies um, 
uh, that may address comorbid conditions. Uh, trauma may be uh, present in ADHD, so looking at that through psychotherapy. Medications being a ma mainstay of treatment, but also things like peer support and psychoeducation being very important, something that the Attitudes Magazine provides uh, and, and some of the other national organizations provide. Um, there's also strategies um, looking at brain training uh, that includes neurofeedback as well as working memory training. Um, mindfulness can be put in that category um, and as well as approaches um, looking at uh, kind of electromagnetic stimulation, TMS uh, is an example such as uh, uh, it's it's mainstream, not as often used, but it's being investigated. So some of these strategies are uh, more or less accepted um, in, in the treatment of ADHD. Uh, but if you take a broader approach of ADHD rarely travels alone, there's all these other things that in mental health and physical health that need to be addressed, these other approaches can be brought in. Uh, light therapy uh, is also used, especially if there's a mood component. And then if needed, um, if the symptoms and the comorbid conditions are really, um, um, you know, difficult, there's, uh, when there's severe symptoms, considering things like hospitalizations or even uh, ECT. On the right-hand side, I've listed different wellness fundamentals, um, things, again, that can be done on your own um, or with support of, of a coach or a therapist or a clinician. Uh, which I think are very important with ADHD. I think um, stress management is very important and some of the other things, and I'll, I'll go over that in a moment. Uh, looking at relationships, looking at environment, uh, how much time in nature is being spent, and things like uh, security, security in relationships, but also the basics in terms of um, financial security, pursuing education and, and career, and having a sense of kind of security in, in, in your direction in life. Right at the bottom, we're looking at the CAM or complementary alternative medicine strategies, um, also referred to as integrative strategies that are often done in collaboration with a, another clinician. Um, and this includes functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, uh, let's say chiropractic medicine, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So here's some of these strategies that may be utilized, looking at brain-gut uh, interaction, optimizing the microbiome, looking at diet manipulation, supplements, herbs, acupuncture, particularly in the uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine tradition. Um, let's say chiropractic medicine may look at manual uh, manipulation, uh, other physical therapies, functional testing, or looking at micronutrients or looking at different uh, deficiencies or even toxicants in the environment can be brought in. Um, and, you know, some of the practitioners are trained in a whole systems of care that utilize their own diagnostic tools. So this is sort of a snapshot of, of the integrative medicine land, as you will, uh, that there are these different tools. It can be quite overwhelming to say, where do I start? Um, and so in thinking about that, um, there's some things to, th to consider. You know, what are some of the things that you can do on your own, particularly those wellness strategies? Uh, maybe on your own with support of a, of a therapist or, or a peer group. Um, and what are some that require with another professional? And, you know, is, is that professional covered by my insurance or is it something that's out of pocket uh, expense and, and weighing those considerations? Um, keep in mind that, um, ADHD studies using integrative approaches are limited. Um, so still they're not fully evidence-based. However, uh, you know, based on a, a specific intervention, the, the, the evidence base may be uh, um, bigger or, or, or smaller. There may be um, uh, more evidence for it for other mental health conditions. So if you do have anxiety or depression, you may bring in integrative approach into overall treatment uh, because the evidence there is pretty strong. So it's, it's important to, to weigh those risks and benefits um, as well as uh, cost, um, time cost, financial cost, and, and, and thinking through those decisions. 
Um, in choosing a strategy, you know, there's always a desire to try to minimize medications. And I, I, I very much understand that, especially with children. Um, it, it is important to consider, though, how urgent and impairing the ADHD symptoms are. You know, are there already consequences in school or at work uh, because of the ADHD symptoms? And we're trying to do something quickly to help the person. If that's the case, I would say medication have an important role to play because they can work fairly quickly. If the person is able to tolerate the medication, it's a good choice uh, to sort of get going, establish some uh, uh, routines, and then with that support of medication, start bringing some of the other integrative strategies like lifestyle, healthy lifestyle. Um, if the symptoms are not urgent and particularly if they're mild to moderate, we do know ADHD exists on the spectrum. Um, so depending on how severe uh, the symptoms are, you may choose to start with non-medication approaches, whether it's therapy or coaching, supplements, lifestyle changes, diet. Um, it's important to think about, is this do, you know, what's doable for me or for my family? Uh, and not feel like I have to, um, you know, do everything at once or I can, or feel bad about, um, you know, not doing integrative strategies or bad about doing medications. It's, it's what is, you know, what makes sense, what's practical right now. Um, and maybe that will change in the future. Okay. May, uh, what I often recommend to people who come to me and it's more urgent uh, to start treatment is that we start with medications and then we work on the other strategies. So then you can minimize the medication or stop the medication in the future. Uh, sometimes we you know, start with non-medication approaches first, see how that's, that's working, and we may not need to use medications. And sometimes we phase in uh, because of a certain stage of life, for example, or uh, the person is, has a big project and you know, uses medication as a tool during that time, but not others, other times. Okay, um, so here are the fundamentals that I mentioned. Um, stress management skills, I really want to emphasize that that's, there's such a reciprocal relationship between the stress, ability to activate uh, executive function skills, you know, your prefrontal cortex shuts down under stress, and so there's a need to learn how to regulate that, how to regulate emotions, um, and, um, and through that, kind of help yourself recover your uh, problem-solving ability, the executive functions. Um, and I'll touch on all these pieces uh, as we go along. So here, um, this is a common uh, picture of stress response. This is to emphasize we have um, two autonomic nervous system paths, one that is activating um, or response to stress can bring on the fight, flight, or freeze response. That's the sympathetic nervous system. And we have the other arm of the autonomic nervous system that is calming, soothing, and can bring down the response in the body, in the physiology, um, after the stress is removed. What's important here is, this, as you see this yellow circle, it's an external event seen as a threat. So what is seen as a threat can vary from person to person. What will activate this response can vary from person to person. The same situation may affect different people uh, differently. Oftentimes the ADHD behaviors, what gets in your own way, um, you know, or maybe others' responses to the ADHD symptoms can feel very much uh, stressful and as a threat. And so there's a, it's very important to understand for yourself, you know, what really um, activates the stress response for me and, you know, how can I learn to step back and modulate that uh, and maybe reframe it. Something is a threat, but maybe it's no longer a threat if I reframe it. And that very much goes also for negative emotions. Negative emotions can get kicked up um, when, you know, when ADHD symptoms are, are present and activate self-judgments, shame, you know, fear, and um, having an ability to deal with those negative emotions in a different way can make a, a big difference in how much stress is, is experienced on a daily basis. Here's a quote from, a, uh, from William James, a 19th century 
psychologist that the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought or reaction over another. And that's where uh, mindfulness, something that I've spent a lot of, many of my years uh, studying and writing about can be helpful, is how you respond to stress uh, and creating a choice in your response. Um, so mindfulness often um, <laughs> creates stress for somebody with ADHD thinking, you know, I can't meditate. This is something that's so difficult for me. Uh, so um, I think it's important to um, maybe break it down and say mindfulness is is trained in meditation, but it's also something that can be activated in daily life through sort of brief shifts in your attention and your attitude. Um, so practicing bringing attention to the present moment, particularly inward, checking in, you know, how am I feeling, what's going on, uh, noticing the body responses, um, and bringing the attitude of curiosity and openness to that observation so you can learn about yourself and understand yourself a little bit better. Um, and when negative emotions are brought up, oftentimes there's self-judgments or when ADHD gets in the way, there's self-judgments. So also practicing acceptance and uh, self-compassion. Here's a slide showing that mindfulness is very much uh, a mind and brain training. There are different uh, brain uh, regions that are activated with mindful mindfulness, uh, and they're very much involved in attention regulation, um, as well as areas in the prefrontal cortex. So there's an executive function training uh, that is it, that happens as you practicing mindfulness. I mentioned self-compassion being an important part of, um, of mindfulness. And, you know, you can think of mindfulness and self-compassion as approaches that, as, again, can be done through practice of meditation. There's some guide, uh, guidelines or, or classes that you can take, uh, apps and books. But it's also a question of what helps me connect with myself in the pr present moment and that will be, what is my way of being mindful about my reactions? Or what are some ways that help me be more self-compassionate? Okay, you, can, you may have your own ways of checking in and bringing that sense of acceptance and compassion. And those are often good places to start if the more typical mindfulness practice seems um, difficult. And then, you know, there are other ways of exploring, whether it's resources or apps or books or classes on that. Self-compassion I see as, as a sort of a critical component of ADHD management uh, because ADHD gets in the way, um, you know, can, can be irritating to others, can be irritating to yourself. There can be a lot of um, misconceptions and judgments that uh, come with that. So being able to have a buffer against it by having proper ADHD education, understanding, you know, yourself better, and then bringing that sense of acceptance, self-compassion, and self-advocacy to your relationships, to your workplace, to your school, to your parenting. Um, and here's some resources that I mentioned on kind of going more deeply into that. So, you know, we often think of management um, of ADHD as, you know, something you can do in terms of um, uh, managing stress, trying to mitigate negative symptoms. But there's something to be said about bringing up positivity as well as a, as a, as a way to, to help somebody thrive. So looking at how can I bring more positive experiences into my life, uh, positive emotions, whether it's practicing gratitude or engaging in things that really bring you joy. So not not minimizing the need for that, um, finding uh, places where there is a sense of mastery or accomplishment. Even though there's areas of struggle, what are some of those areas when someone can experience accomplishment and feeling good about yourself, what you, you know, what you're able to do? Um, looking for areas where you can bring a sense of meaning or purpose. Um, I know that oftentimes, you know, getting engaged in advocacy uh, can be very meaningful and, and also create connections. Um, authentic connections to self and others um, are very important. And that's where, um, um, you know, bringing 
uh, yourself, your or family members to to these meetings, the webinars, uh, to conferences is is very important. And also taking the time to sort of figure out, you know, what within this ADHD world that I'm learning about applies to me. Some of it will not apply. Some of it will. So being self-affirming and knowing that, you know, this strategy helps me. This does not help me. Um, and having that internal compass as you navigate through through so many different options. Um, so through psychology, we can help manage stress sort of top down, but there are also things that are really important to engage as a sort of a bottom-up bottom up approach to mind, uh, mental health, emotional uh, well-being. So physical exercise, very helpful with ADHD. So making time to have some of that. Um, if exercise feels like a big um, undertaking, just thinking of movement uh, or time outside in nature, you know, moving in nature as something that can be very helpful. Uh, approaches like yoga, tai chi, meditation can be also helpful, particularly because they emphasize breath work. Uh, and breath work, there are different approaches to breath work, but having a way to deep, you know, set, set some time or have some practices that help you deepen your breathing, slow down your breathing a little bit, um, are ways to put brakes on chronic stress. So stress will make you breathe more shallow, uh, usually faster. And so a lot, giving your body opportunities to have deeper breaths, slower breath can you know, counteract the, the impact of chronic stress. So, you know, self-care habits. Habits are hard with ADHD. Um, persistence is difficult. You can have good intentions, hard to keep up with things. Uh, but there's some key habits that are worth really investing and putting energy in. Things like sleep and a sort of daily structure, making sure that there's a regular time to bed or at least some uh, effort to not stray so much from day to day. Um, looking at, um, you know, regular meals, hydration, those things can really support uh, uh, brain function as well. It can support cognitive um, abilities or in the moment. Uh, looking at your environment, how the environment can support you. Um, starting with things like, you know, organizing your workspace to things like, you know, are there things in the environment that, that are actually affecting my physical health and maybe also affecting my cognitive health, like toxins. Um, for example, pollutants in, in our food can have an effect on the brain and cognitive function, looking at opportunities to decrease that burden, such as looking for organic foods uh, or, um, you know, look, uh, looking at, at uh, um, cleaners that may be more friendly, uh, not as uh, uh, toxic uh, to the environment, or, or even looking at things, you know, as, as testing, uh, functional testing with a naturopath um, physician that might be helpful. So discerning for yourself, is this an important area for me or not uh, to address? Um, because not everything can be tackled at the same time. Um, looking at rhythm of work and breaks, breaks very important as a sort of replenishing that self-regulation ability or self-regulation tank. Um, this is a term used by Dr. Barkley, which I uh, really like that you think about, you know, starting a day with a certain ca capacity to tackle things, tackle tasks, tackle relationships, interactions, um, and then that that can be either supported by certain habits or it can be depleted more quickly by certain habits. Not having enough breaks will, will be one of them. Certain food choices uh, or, you know, diet can, can uh, impact that. Um, you know, having, um, not having uh, ability to have exercise breaks or kind of uh, a replenishing uh, activities will also affect it. And thinking of those habits as a way to support yourself, putting importance on yourself, like I matter, these habits are really important. And there's maybe a lot of pressure from the outside to, uh, to not um, 
you know, not attend to myself, but, but, you know, self-care as an act of resistance. I think that sometimes that can resonate with those who, who have an, a rebellious streak is to say, these things are important. The stuff from outside uh, can, can wait, or I, I can make time for myself. Healthy diet, so important. Um, you can start by stopping the bad foods and look at what are the good foods. Um, typically, we talk about food dyes and preservatives as, as aggravating ADHD for uh, some, uh, some individuals with ADHD, particularly there's studies with children. Not every child uh, is affected, but um, some are, and it's worthwhile to remove those. And as you remove dyes and preservatives, you also tend to start using more, less processed foods, and that's actually increasing the good foods in your diet. Uh, some people are more sensitive, especially if there's a history of allergies or asthma, um, or there's you know a tendency to get rash after eating certain foods. It might be worthwhile to look at inflammatory foods and taking them out of your diet. Uh, the two most important ones are gluten. Uh, or wheat, and also casein, which is uh, the protein found in, in dairy. Uh, starting there is helpful. Some people do testing, functional test, uh, sort of a uh, food sensitivity testing. Um, that's controversial. It's looking at IgG response to different foods. There's still some, um, you know, uh, lack of understanding whether that represents uh, just uh, exposure to foods versus sensitivity to them. Those tests can be helpful. Sometimes they're overwhelming because you may find you're sensitive to everything. So having another way to prioritize what you're eliminating you, using elimination diet um, and working with a nutritionist can be very helpful. Um, an elimination diet is by taking things out, keeping diary, uh, and reintroducing uh, foods uh, gradually and then seeing your response. That's the gold standard to find sensitivity. Other things to remove would be red meat, uh, processed meat, uh, refined gray, uh, grains, um, and, and sweets, as well as high-fat dairy. The good foods are very much aligned with what's called Mediterranean diet. Uh, so uh, as you can see, you know, whole foods, minimally processed. Um, looking also at uh, glycemic index of food or how quickly the food increases your sugar in, 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 in your blood because you may have the spike and then crash. So looking at that, um, looking at how many nuts and berries you have in your diet, those are very um, healthy foods for the brain. And then things that can support the gut uh, by using pro prebiotics, uh, vegetables, fruits, as well as fermented foods, the probiotic foods, um, foods like yogurt, for example, um, um, and kimchi, a sauerkraut, things like that. Quickly, here's a picture of um, a, a Mediter modified Mediterranean diet that was studied in depression, uh, looking at uh, the fact that if you change your diet, your depression symptoms can improve. And so he, this gives you an idea of sort of what are different uh, recommendations that you would want to, what would you want to have in your diet as a basis? This, we're not talking about perfection here. You can sometimes have foods that are processed or, you know, sugary. That's okay. But what is the base, you know, the baseline for you when it comes to diet? Uh, are these, um, you know, components part of your regular diet? Uh, we know that healthy diet can affect the microbiome in the gut. And that itself has these upstream effects in terms of reducing anxiety symptoms, Serum cortisol level is often lower if there's a healthy biome. Inflammatory responses are decreased. Um, and uh, there are some interesting studies looking at, you know, uh, responses uh, uh, on the, on the uh, functional responses in the brain uh, to manipulation of diet. So using yogurt as a, as a manipulation in um, um, as an intervention and looking how anxiety as well as the brain responses to stressful uh, stimuli change because of that intervention. So through food affecting the brain. Now talking about supplements, um, there are supplements uh, that are studied for ADHD symptoms specifically. 
And also there are supplements that are studied more for general mental health support. And those, both of those can be co combined in treatment of ADHD. As I talked about before, you know, I, questions to ask if you're thinking, should I be using supplements is how severe your symptoms are? What are other symptoms? Uh, what is the diet? Um, are there suspected GI issues that may affect malabsorption? And then thinking about the costs and the amount of pills that may be required if you're doing supplements. Um, the first place to start is always diet. And if that is not enough, then thinking of supplements. Here are common supplements for ADHD. Omega fatty acids have a pretty good uh, evidence base. Uh, you want to have uh, more EPA versus a DHA amount. It's important to look at the EPA and DHA, not just the amount of fish oil, but what are the actual amounts of these two components. Um, and using about 1,000 up to 2,000 milligrams um, to supplement zinc, uh, as well as ferritin, which is a marker of iron stores in the body, are very um, important for ADHD. We they tend to be lower when you have ADHD. We still don't know, you know what causes what, but oftentimes supplementing uh, zinc um, or supplementing iron, you can start with iron-rich diet or actual supplement um, if deficiency is severe, can um, help reduce the, the need for stimulants or have a better response with stimulants. So actually supplements and medications can work together, uh, or you may avoid using medications. Um, other things that um, have good evidence is using vitamin D, which also tends to be lower with ADHD, um, and optimizing sleep with melatonin. Um, other supplements listed that are very common are using magnesium, can help with anxiety and sleep, um, also gets depleted with stress, so using that can be helpful. It's something that's it's hard to measure the level of in the body, so sometimes we just use it. Uh, empirically or based on symptoms, B vitamins being critical for production of neurotransmitters, uh, being cofactors in many uh, brain processes. It's often helpful to use a, comp a B complex formula as each, you know, many vi B vitamins work together. And there's also pretty good uh, research uh, in adults uh, and in children using what's called broad spectrum micronutrient formula. Again, getting away from maybe using one supplement to using uh, multiple supplements as a way to, uh, to, uh, to help ADHD symptoms. Herbs uh, are also used. Um, they're an um, important uh, component of integrative treatment, uh, especially if diet or those more uh, evidence-based supplements are not helping. I've listed some of them that have evidence in ADHD. Uh, and then depending on these other symptoms that may be present, whether it's more of a, a problem with sleep or anxiety or, uh, you know, needing more energy and motivation, you can e either use more activating or more calming herbs. It's important to look at quality here. Not so important with vitamins or minerals because they're pretty standard. But when it comes to herbs, um, you know, how they're harvested, how they're prepared is critical and it can really make a difference between response or not response. Um, the two uh, herbs I really like to use, again, emphasizing how important it is to manage stress in ADHD, is uh, herbs called adaptogens. There are many different adaptogens. I highlighted two, uh, rhodiola rosea and ashwagandha. Um, because they're kind of opposite, rhodiola tends to be activating or stimulating, ashwagandha is more calming. So if there is more of an anxiety picture, sleep difficulty, you can use the calming adaptogen, ashwagandha, uh, and, and those can be combined with vitamins and micronutrients. Or if you need more, kind, if you're wanting to avoid stimulants, you want something more stimulating, rhodiola rosea would be a good choice. When working with integrative provider, um, I think uh, it's important to um, um, think about, you know, what, what are my where do I want to start? What makes sense to me? Uh, or maybe even uh, just um, talk and interview different providers. What is your approach like? Um, because there's so many different trainings. People come from different, uh, ang you could say, angles at, uh, at, at healing or at, at, at diagnosis and treatment. Um, here's some examples of integrative providers, naturopathic medis uh, medicine providers, functional medicine providers, 
Um, they're quite similar. They will emphasize some testing, uh, laboratory testing. There's chiropractic medicine that will also look at uh, ma ma manual manipulation. And then whole systems of care that have their own diagnostics like Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. I wanted to just quickly say that acupuncture is not something we typically talk about in treatment of ADHD, but I find it quite helpful in part because it is part of a kind of more overall whole person approach uh, with herbs and dietary lifestyle advice that's, uh, that's part of Chinese medicine approach. It's also often covered by insurance, particularly if there's additional pain or stress related conditions. So it's an option for those who might be uh, out of pocket cost for other integrative providers significant. Um, and it's also a good option for those who have trouble finding, you know, engaging in, uh, in strategies to bring that time of, um, of, you know, parasympathetic response or relaxation or, you know, offsetting the stress. If you're having difficulty meditating or finding uh, relaxing strategies and you, you're not afraid of needles, then acupuncture could be a good place uh, to try. I mentioned some of these. It's important to find someone who can work with you in a collaborative way with you and your other clinicians. Um, you can interview different providers and there's places on internet where you can find people who are trained and certified in different approaches. And um, I've listed Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, uh, there's also American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, Institute of Functional Medicine, there's Institute of Functional Nutrition. So finding providers there can be helpful. Um, just a quick snapshot, we're running out of time. So I'm just going to quickly say here on the left side, some things that maybe a conventional provider would use. And the, on the right hand side, things that can be added, things we've mentioned uh, to the uh, whole person approach in ADHD. Okay, so um, in a way, just uh, closing thoughts, you know, medications can be phased in, phased out, or stopped as needed, so depending how much you invest in these other strategies. And I think it's very important to, you know, prioritize and have support when implementing an integrative approach. Um, so not being alone in this journey, but having a therapist, uh, community uh, support, um, working with a coach, uh, you know, uh, family members that are aligned with the with with your desire to bring integrative approaches can really make a difference. And in the in uh, after the webinar, you can check out some of these resources, books on mindfulness, self compassion integrative approaches specifically for ADHD, and then integrative approaches to more the other comorbidities that can be common with ADHD or, you know, expanding your thinking um, about this area. So with that, I'll stop and hopefully we'll have some mm -hmm. questions. Yes, there were plenty. That was excellent. That was really excellent. Very insightful. Um, a couple of people have asked, are there there are many mindfulness apps out there, Calm, Headspace, Insight. Are there any that have been found to be better for people with ADHD? You know, um, people vary what they resonate with. So I think I always recommend trying to listen to a couple of different options and finding the one that's helpful. I do like Headspace because they do start with very brief meditations. They have also some visually appealing little videos which I think is ADHD friendly. Um, another app that's been designed more for um, teens and young adults is called My Life, it used to be uh, called uh, Stop, Breathe and Think. And so there's, um, again, um, there's emphasis on variety of, uh, of practices, sort of learning to do things in a playful way. I think that's ADD friendly, ADHD friendly. Um, there are, um, you know, uh, there's also um, a, a new app. Um, as a full disclosure, I am connected to them as a as an advisor. Uh, but uh, there's an inflow app which brings ADHD education and CBT strategies, and also has some uh, short, brief uh, kind of uh, core mindfulness practices as part of it as well. Mm -hmm. But 
but really kind of, you know, I, I want to empower people to say there is no one place, you know, try different, different apps and find the one that um, works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, what about cannabis and CBD oil? Several people are using it and said that they found it effective for themselves. Does that fit into your treatment plan or there's not enough research on that front? Uh, not enough research mm -hmm. is 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 the state of the evidence right now, um, and there's a lot of controversy about using cannabis products in general in mental health. In general, you know, if you're using a cannabis product, it's better to use CBD versus anything that has THC in it, just because mm -hmm. the THC component of uh, of marijuana or cannabis is psychoactive, meaning can affect um, uh, your cognition and it can also af affect your mood. Uh, you know, some people find that helpful for anxiety, but it can also have kind of backfire by sensitizing to anxiety. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody thinks they're very, this has been very helpful for them, I generally try to discourage THC and steer them to uh, try CBD instead. It's not something I utilize in my treatment very much. Uh, so if uh, I do see it has a role for pain and for an, uh, being anti-inflammatory, and if that's part of the whole person's uh, sort of health picture, uh, then I would uh, refer to, uh, let's say, naturopathic colleague that utilizes CBD so they can, um, you know, advise the person on that. CBD products are quite expensive and there may be other anti-inflammatory options. So that's also important to consider. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's a collaborative approach in general. So, um, you know, working together with the patient as well, maybe as another practitioner to figure out, you know, what makes sense for the, that particular person with their set of symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, several people have asked they weren't familiar with TMS. Could you explain that? TMS. Um, uh, so it's trans... Uh, uh, they... Transmagnetic simulation. Um, yes. So TMS is is used quite a bit now uh, for treatment of depression, um, and even uh, uh, for anxiety. But the be the FDA indication is primarily for for depression. Uh, it's something that uh, some insurances cover, but usually after you've tried other things, it has been studied in ADHD, but it's not seen as as a kind of approved for for standard treatment of ADHD. So there's some, um, um, you know, encouraging studies, actually, I think they're from Israel, showing that TMS treatment uh, was helpful. This is in, when adults with ADHD, and then, um, you know, based on sort of the, uh, the EEG pattern of the person's brain before treatment, you could say who's more likely to respond, but it's early research. So we're still kind of in this early phase of trying to understand, is it helpful um, for ADHD across different spectrum of symptoms, you know, uh, and then having more evidence so it could become more standard. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense when you're interviewing a, looking for and interviewing a holistic uh, practitioner, um, to put him or her in touch with your primary care physician to see if there would be a collaboration or do they not have time for that? Well, I think that's very important to see if, you know, if they can collaborate. Um, it, it's not always a case. People do get busy. They don't always get in right. touch. But I think it's important to at least communicate with all your providers what you're doing. So, you know, letting them know, you know, I've engaged, uh, you know, working with a uh, functional medicine doctor as you talk to your primary care doctor and get a sense of, you know, are they open to it? Would they want to know a little bit more about what's happening? Um, you know, they may dissuade you and mm -hmm. you have to then use your own judgment. Do I take that advice or not? There is some strong biases in the conventional community about some of these approaches or opinions, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I would say that has changed over the last 10 years. A lot of, uh, you know, conventional clinicians, a lot of psychiatrists nowadays are open and very interested in uh, integrative approaches. Um, they want to utilize uh, different tools. 
They might not know enough how to utilize them, but they're, 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 they do, they might want to talk to your integrative provider and, and have a relationship and, and check in. And it's also important that whoever you work, there is someone that you're working with that understands the interactions between medications and herbs and supplements, whether it's the integrative provider or maybe your physician is willing to advise you on that because there are some contraindications depending on the supplement uh, or herbs that you have to be aware of. And that's very much true if you are an anticoagulant medication, for example, there may be some uh, interactions that affect levels of medication. So it's it's something that you would want to ask um, one of your clinicians if they can talk to you, you know, help you figure this out. Is it okay to take the supplement with whatever else I'm taking? Mm-hmm. Several people are interested in neurofeedback, and I want to know if there's any uh, good evidence for its benefits. Yes, there is good evidence for uh, effectiveness of neurofeedback. Um, there is um, there are different approaches within neurofeedback, different ways people train neurofeedback. Um, so, um, you know, um, there are you know certain trainings that are that have been studied more than others. Uh, there's a theta beta ratio training. Um, there are other sort of uh, uh, markers that people look at uh, and trying to regulate the brain, and that that's related to better response. I, I am not someone who uh, provides neurofeedback, so I'm not an expert in this area. Mm-hmm. But I would say it is something that has evidence based. What you want to to do is find the practitioner that is uh, trained well and can kind of tell you what training they have. Um, and then you can always try and just see if it's a, it's a good fit. Um, I definitely think, you know, it can be helpful. It is time consuming treatment. Often you need 30 to 40 treatments. It's not typically covered by insurance, so it can be costly. So it's something to consider, but it does have lasting impact. So you can, um, you know, typically, uh, people who have gone through training and have benefited from the training they retain that skill. It doesn't go away when you stop the training. Right. Several people have asked about diagnosis. Um, One woman had said, would I see a psychiatrist or a neurologist for a diagnosis of adult ADD? So psychiatrists. I mean, some neurologists would treat ADHD um, as well as primary care doctors, some family physicians are quite comfortable treating ADHD. Uh, but if you want a more thorough diagnosis, uh, that's also taking into account other mental health disorders, uh, a psychiatrist are best trained, or maybe s- starting with a psychologist. Um, some psychologists can do diagnostic assessment, um, and also neuropsychologists can do a diagnostic assessment. Um, and so you could start with a mental health provider and then they can guide you to what's the best way to get assessed and then what's the best way to then get treatment. So you may start with a psychologist for ADHD assessment. And then once the diagnosis is established and you may need a psychiatrist, uh, you can start with mm-hmm. a psychiatrist who may refer you to a psychologist mm-hmm. for testing and then come back for medication treatment, for example, or for other treatments. Um, so I would say you know, that's a good way to start. For child, uh, for children, it's a little different. I mean, the question is about adult ADHD, but for children, pediatricians or and especially neurobehaviorally, neurobehavior uh, uh, pedi- uh, pe- trained pediatricians are a good choice. Neurologists can also help more likely with children than with adults. Mm-hmm. Finally, someone says, how do we keep up how, does she, how would she be able to keep up with all the trends on the alternative medicine and ADHD front? Are there any medi- uh, publications you recommend, several maybe that you recommend that they could read just to stay on top of the studies? Yeah, so I think actually in the last, um, you know, in the recent past, last maybe five to seven years, there have been books that have come out uh, on integrative treatment of uh, of ADHD. Um, mm-hmm. I've had it on my slides there. Uh, there's a book by uh, Patricia Gerberg and Richard Brown uh, on right. integrative approaches mm-hmm. to ADHD. Uh, uh, Dr. Newmark, Sanford Newmark has, has had a book uh, that's been updated. 
Um, that's a good resource. And Dr. J, uh, Jim Greenblatt has another one. There's somewhat different, you know, um, ways to approach ADHD, you know, um, but you, you'll get a lot of information from those books. Um, I also like the book called Natural Mental Health, which has a lot of very sound advice, uh, especially for children and families with ADHD. Uh, it's written by a pediatrician and, um, and family medicine doc, I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, there are these sources. Uh, I think Attitude Magazine actually has quite a few resources and there are periodic webinars on what's the latest in this sphere. Uh, there are other ways to, to do it. But I would say, you know, working with someone is helpful. Um, you know, finding a clinician um, so that that keeps on top of this and then can help you make sense of all the different things and, and right. help you prioritize things. I think mm -hmm. that's, I, I want to stress that things can be so overwhelming when you look at, should I be doing this and this? And then you end <laughs> up with multiple bottles of supplements and still feel pressure. I should be meditating and I should be working on my diet. That's that can be too much. So I would say look looking at the list of different approaches. Uh, maybe that slide I had there for different wellness approaches or integrative approaches. Pick one or two and say this is I think where um, I can put my energy because I think this 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 will make a difference. And I would say the the, the top four things will be diet, um, exercise, sleep, and then some way to look uh, to regulate your stress, mm -hmm. some strategies and understanding what stresses you, what helps you. Right. Well, I think the hour is up. Thank you for joining us today and for contributing your voice to the ADHD community. It was great to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. And make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 374 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Have a great day. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com.